Welcome to CityWorks, a co-production of the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies and CUNY TV. I'm Laura Flanders. Every month, CityWorks explores the lives of working people on the job, at home, and in our communities in order to see how best to advance an agenda of social and economic equality. On today's show, we're going to explore the video gaming industry. Nothing short of a major sector. About two-thirds of Americans, most of them adults, play video games. The industry was worth nearly $200 billion in 2021, more than music, book publishing, and North American sports combined. And it employed hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. alone. Controversies over sexism in the industry have dogged it for years. In 2014, the so-called Gamergate incident was exposed, with hate speech, even death threats, being directed at women gaming workers by male members of their own community. Many of these problems go back to the earliest days of the industry, when game developers facilitated a kind of frat-like image of boys. Charges of racial discrimination have been lodged, too, against gaming companies. Of the respondents to a survey, only 5% were black, while close to 80% were white, suggesting an enormous gap that exists in the industry. Against the backdrop, the gaming industry is changing. Here's the good news. After years of groundwork laid over social media in large part, in their fight against a history of overwork, low pay, and harassment, workers are seeing gains. Over the past few years, there's been progress as workers vow to make changes in their workplaces. Labor organizers in the tech industry kicked off 2023 with a monumental victory, scoring the first U.S. union at Microsoft. Microsoft's subsidiary ZeniMax makes games, employing 300 quality assurance workers. They voted to unionize in January, and now they are members of the Communications Workers of America, CWA. On today's program, I'm going to be joined by Nicole Carpenter, a senior reporter for Polygon, who has followed the rise of unions in the video game industry, and Aaron Mahoney, assistant director for organizing at the Communication Workers of America. Welcome, Nicole Carpenter and Aaron Mahoney. It's great to have you with me. Um, let's start with you, Aaron. I mean, we did a show about this not so, well, it is a long time ago. It feels like a long time ago, probably more than three years. The situation there felt very rough and grim and a very steep uphill battle lay ahead. Can you tell a bit of the story of what's happened since? Yes, I mean, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing success story. I mean, I think we are operating in a worker uprising in a time of a lot of excitement in the labor movement and also a lot of self-organizing in the game and tech industry. In our union, the Communication Workers of America, worked with workers in that industry to, to form what we call the Code CWA, which is the campaign to organize digital employees, and launched that several years ago. And since then, we've organized units like you just mentioned in Zinemax, a Microsoft-owned video game company, also two units in Activision Blizzard of quality assurance workers in Wisconsin and in New York. We just recently organized um, at eBay in Syracuse, New York, a warehouse that works with Magic for the Gathering cards. The, the employer fought these workers tooth and nail and they overcame the anti-union campaign and won that election. We've also organized at Google, which is not the game industry, but is, has had a huge impact on the tech industry as a whole. We've got over 1,200 workers organizing and paying union dues and doing activism at the Alphabet Workers Union. I mean, it's very exciting mm. times and a lot of breakthroughs. So a lot of progress, but we also need to remember where we came from. And I, I'm, a, I'm sorry to do this to you, Nicole, but for people who are not familiar with this entire sector, we've pointed out that it's big and a lot of Americans participate. Mm -hmm. But just the basics, I mean, gaming is not just for kids, right? When we're talking about gaming, what are we talking about? Right, we're talking about a hobby, um, a job for adults as well. There are people who, there, there are lots of people who work in this industry and a lot of people that play games. Um, if you have a, a candy crush on your phone, you're a gamer. And so this this segment, uh, it, it goes much further than people think, and it has a huge influence on the culture. Now talk a little bit about what the climate was like in this field when you entered it, Nicole. I mean, take us back a bunch of years. I remember hearing about the Gamergate story and realizing, wow, there is a whole and very scary scenario playing out right under my nose that I was entirely unaware of. 
Well, so Gamergate was around 2014 and basically was an online harassment campaign against feminism um, and diversity in the industry. So coming into this as a young journalist, it was very scary. Um, what we were seeing was under the guise of ethics and games journalism. And so, um, you know, that was a farce. What this was really was about was about, uh, you know, wanting to keep that frat mentality, wanting to keep that boys club atmosphere. I mean, because it's true still to say, I think, that gaming as an industry, as we're hearing, is not just white dominated, but male dominated, still mm -hmm. targets male players, male customers. Are men the overwhelming majority of people who still game? Or what's the reality, Nicole? No, I don't think men are the overwhelming uh, majority of people who play games. Um, even for workers in the industry, it is still male dominated, but it's changing very, very rapidly. And I think some of the people who are leading this labor movement are people from marginalized genders. And uh, to go yeah, back, that's, it's really cool to see. Yeah, I, I just have to go back for a second to the level of violence that we were talking about. We're mm -hmm. talking online, but it was of the sort that led some women gamers and people, women in the industry to leave their homes, to feel terrified in their daily lives. Uh, a lot of the same aggravation and, and harassment and aggression that we saw feeding into that um, anti-Clinton, Hillary Clinton um, uh, campaign was sort of first seen, I think, during that period. Um, talk a bit about the people that you've spoken to, Nicole, and then we'll come um, to you and about organizing in this sector. What were they up against and how have they advanced to thinking that they could organize? Like what gave them the idea? Mm. Well, so the harassment that people receive online has those very real consequences. And that extends to how developers are treated as well. Um, and beyond that, how developers are treated by the company they work for. Um, that boys club mentality has been uh, not only within people who play video games, but the people who make video games as well. And a lot of these companies have historically had that sort of culture. Um, I think that in the past couple of years, workers have started to use the power that they have together to enact that change, to realize that they have the power to change that. And um, the harassment, sexual harassment, discrimination, racism are all huge issues that people are looking to come up against when they're unionizing. And um, that extends as well to, you know, safety in the workplace. Um, Aaron spoke about the TCG player workers. Um, that's a warehouse environment and that can lead to, you know, repetitive, repetitive, uh, you know, Motion. hand injuries, right. things like that. And uh, when we're talking about video game developers as well, there's the issue of crunch and that's overwork. and. That's been something that has plagued the video game industry for a really, really long time. And that's a, a very serious health issue, so, as well as a workplace issue. So, Aaron, two things. Let's just remind people what some of these workers are up against as, as workers. Mm -hmm. um, and then what do you think has contributed to the change? Yes, I mean, there's a whole wide variety of issues that folks are facing. Many of them are faced in, in every job we see, and some are really particular to the game industry. So I think things like low wages, especially the quality assurance testers, um, surprisingly low wages for being an industry that, that boasts like $180 billion in profit globally, right? I mean, they're not for loss of money, right? They can pay their workers. Just a path, a career path to advancement so people get pigeonholed in one area and no room to move or anywhere, um, no clear trajectory. Uh, things like, like sexual harassment, discrimination we've spoken about, job security, like having the ability to speak up, like having um, the faith that, that they can blow the whistle on things and, and not be retaliated against, I think is a big issue folks are organizing around. And this phenomenon of crunch? And this phenomenon of crunch. I mean, it's it's horrible, right? I mean, so when you're, you're trying to get a game out, instead of the executives and the people on the top here really planning this out in a thoughtful way, they just bank on workers being able to work 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week in the month leading up to a release. I mean, we have stories of, of people working the day shift and the night shift, people, you know, sleeping in their car or sleeping in their office, like, I mean, like 80 hour work weeks for a month straight and having anxiety attacks, like following that because of those periods of time. And they're testing to see how the game works. So they have to follow it from beginning to end. Completely. And really, like, I mean, all range of, of job titles are working these sorts of crunch. But yes, the quality assurance folks are testing it and could be, you know, hand and eye injuries from this. Other folks are 
working on development and just working extremely long hours that are just not needed. I think a lot of the workers in this field are doing it be mostly because it's a passion project, right? I mean, it's an incredible like gift to our society, like the art and the entertainment, um, and they really believe in it. And in, uh, you see in other spheres of tech where people are paid much more and treated much differently than they are in the gaming industry. And I think that's one of the reasons why folks are organizing, because they want to be treated the same as these other industries that, that are paid well and respected. How have you reached out to you know, to employees to be able to organize them? Because my impression, you mentioned some that are working in warehouses, but a lot were working at home before and certainly worked at home during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I think this is an industry that, that is really excited about organizing in terms of the workforce. I mean, when the Uni Global Union, uh, a partner of ours, surveyed the industry, four to five of these workers felt favorable about unionizing and wanted to organize in their workplace. And not only are they doing that, but they're already organizing, right? So you see, like with Activision Blizzard in uh, July 2021, right, we had a massive walkout with thousands of people walking out over issues of sexual discrimination and harassment, right? And they made change just by doing that, by raising that consciousness. Then we saw an EEOC federal agency get involved and put Equal forward employment opportunity commission yes thank you a consent decree that's forcing activision blizzard to change its policies right and to be held accountable and i think the workers aren't stopping there so they did that and they're seeing actually we want long-lasting change we want something that can't be taken back every time we have to walk out right so they're starting to form unions and look at what can we bargain in the union contract to address these sorts of things? So workers are taking action collectively, not just one woman speaking out, which is very brave, but risky, right? They're walking out in like the thousands. They're mm -hmm. forming unions in groups of 300, right? There's safety in numbers and there's power in numbers. And they're, they're wanting it in a contract. They're wanting legal rights and legal change. Nicole, tell some stories. What have you seen that's particularly exciting you want to tell us about on the organizing front? Yeah, well, I think the really interesting thing about the video game industry is that because this is a passion industry, it is something that um, work workplaces can exploit. But the people who work in this industry really love this industry, and that's that, that love of this industry, the love of the work that they're doing, that they use to put forth to unionize. It's part of the reason they are doing this work. It's because they want to continue doing this work, but they want to be fared to be paid fairly and uh, treated treated better. Wouldn't one have to be a hero in the, one of those games in order to survive to the end? You'd rather have some kind of actual rights. Um, which unions have been involved in this? And is this purely a US phenomenon coming to you, Erin? Yes, I mean, I think our union, Communication Workers of America, has been very involved and, um, and proudly organizing the industry, you know, and it is a global effort. Um, just last June, I attended a, a, a global summit of unions from all over the world that were organizing in the game industry, right? We had folks from, from Korea there, from London, from France, um, people getting together, workers from this industry along with union leaders to think, how do we need to adjust? How do we need to talk to workers in this field? How do we need to rebuild and and, and create uh, contract language that can address some of these concerns that we're talking about here. And people are, they're coming together on a global sphere because this is a global industry. Am I just crazy that the culture of solidarity seems in conflict in a way, or at least a, a sharp contrast to the culture of the individual hero that I associate with video games? Am I wrong? Is the culture of the creative product itself changing at all, um, Nicole? Yeah, well, so video games, I think, are seen very much of the time as a solo activity, but they're actually really, um, there's a lot of multiplayer elements there. There's a lot of community built within even communities around single player games. So for me, it doesn't seem at, at odds with uh, the culture of solidarity. Um, I think that teamwork is something that is built into video games and also into video game studios as well. And are the stories changing on the sexism front, Aaron? You know, I think they are. I think that we're starting to see movement from the from the Activision, from the from the action, right? <laughs> I mean, I think um, not necessarily movement at Activision like we'd see, like to see yet, but um, but I think there is cultural shifts because of the organizing, right? I think the fact that thousands of people are walking out over this issue. Um, in two summers in a row, right, doing this. I think we've seen where we can, we've formed unions and gone to an election and now are at the bargaining table trying to put concrete things in a contract. And where we can't get there, we're creating workplace committees where people act like a union and do collective action to raise attention to these issues. So we have a sexual harassment committee at Activision Blizzard, right, that's put together a list of demands that they want to see HR change, including 
things like free childcare, extending uh, family lead to level the playing field, but also things like this is how long it should take for a complaint to be addressed. This is what should be done in an HR meeting. And then we're seeing things at the bargaining table where we're trying to, to say, we want a wage scale so that if there's bias with our manager, they're not determining our increase, right? There is, this is what people get, and we are going to take the bias out of that. We want transparency on what salaries are. We want to be able to request that information and make that public to our membership, what the discrepancies are. And what about the white supremacy piece of all of this, Nicole? Um, yeah, I think that it's still a problem. Um, I think that we, I still hear lots of stories from workers about those sorts of problems in the industry. But I think that the union movement, even for studios that aren't unionized, is emboldening that there is a way out of this and that there is work to be done that could change that. All right, well, we're going to hear more about the work that is to be done and hear from a worker, in fact, herself. Um, but I want to thank you very much, Nicole. It's been great having you with us. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, be joined by a worker at ZeniMax, the Microsoft gaming company that just recently voted to unionize. Stay tuned. The CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies is the 25th and newest school under the CUNY umbrella. Dedicated to public service and social justice, the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies offers undergraduate and graduate degrees in the areas of labor studies and urban studies and certificate programs in labor relations, public administration and public policy, healthcare policy and administration, and community leadership. We pride ourselves on being an institution that brings together activists and academics. Find out more at slu.cuny.edu. We're back with Erin Mahoney, Assistant Director of Organizing for the Communications Workers of America, and Rihanna Eichner, Lead Quality Assurance Tester at ZeniMax, a Microsoft company that just this January voted to join the Communications Workers of America, CWA. Rihanna, start with you. Congratulations on what happened in January. It's pretty exciting. Um, did you feel the move, sh the, the ground shift under your feet? It was a pretty momentous feeling. Uh, the morale of QA really has centered around this unionization effort at this point. And it's so great to see people rallying together. Video games have played a big role in your life, even going way back before you became a worker in the industry. Can you talk about that and why? Why did you and do you love gaming so? Oh, yes. I absolutely love gaming. I have been playing video games since I was about four years old. I grew up watching my sister and then following in her footsteps and playing video games with Mario, Zelda, and Final Fantasy, and many more. So the passion I have for video games is very high. And I understand that Gamergate wasn't enough to put you off. In fact, that's more or less when you entered the industry as a worker. That is correct. I started in the beginning of 2014. And how was life for you at that point as a worker in this field? There was a lot of crunch at that time. Um, that was right before we released our headline game, Elder Scrolls Online, at my studio. So we put in a lot of hours, but I never had any problem with disrespect. So that was, that was lovely. What was it that made you feel and your colleagues feel that a, a unionization drive might be a good idea? And how did it get started? Very simply, we all feel underpaid and overworked, as well as sometimes underappreciated. That was a huge drive for us to decide, you know, let's reach out to CWA, let's see what we can do. And then when Microsoft offered us neutrality, it was, it was a game changer. Tell us what neutrality really means in this context, if you would, Aaron. Yes, I mean, it's, um, it's great. It's a standard that all game and tech companies should hold themselves to. So Microsoft uh, agreed to remain completely neutral, meaning that they will not have an opinion in any way on whether or not workers want to form a union. Um, they trained their managers to to have exactly that, no opinion, and should they went above and beyond in the sense that if a worker was go should go to a manager, the manager would then say, I have no opinion on this. You, if, if you have questions, you should speak with your colleagues who are forming the unions. They're the experts. Um, Managers aren't in unions, right? So they really shouldn't have an opinion. And what we see oftentimes in many industries that don't have neutrality is that 
you know, uh, employers fight this tooth and nail. They have daily meetings with people. They intimidate folks. They, they spread misinformation. And then this is the person that you're getting your paycheck from and your health care from, right? So, of course, you're nervous of any opinion that they have in doing any misstep um, in the workplace. So for uh, an employer to step back and say, we have no opinion on this, it's up to you, um, is the high road. Were you ever nervous to get involved, Ariana? I wasn't. When I was approached by a coworker, I was ecstatic. I was like, this is just what we need. And it, it's funny that when I was approached, I thought back to several years ago, back in 2015, 2016, I said to my husband, I was like, I, I really think we should unionize. And he was like, it'll never happen. And it, it happened. It's happening. So exciting. Do you have any union members in your family or in your social circle? I do not. And that's one of the things that's striking to me about this is we're seeing a lot of progress in a field that is not what you think of when you think of the union movement in America today. And yet I've heard more positivity from you in the last, you know, 10 minutes than I've heard from most of the union organizers I speak to on a regular basis. Why do you think this struggle goes next and where are some of the stumbling blocks? Yes. I mean, I've been organizing for 20 years, and I have to say this is the most positive I've ever been about organizing. So it's nice to actually be able to be on here and be have a positive outlook. I mean, I think that we're coming out of the pandemic with a tighter labor market, and uh, workers know that they have rights and have the ability to organize. I think they saw in the pandemic um, that their employers didn't take them seriously and put their lives at risk. I think Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement have, have changed the consciousness. I think politicians like Bernie Sanders and AOC have also ideologically changed our country and we're seeing the effect of that, you know? Um, so I think workers in this industry particularly have been through a lot, as you've brought up on this program, right? Um, and, that, and that they're brave and they're ready to step out. And um, I think some of the stumbling blocks, I think they're, they're the companies that, that haven't really accepted yet that there's going to be a union in their workplace, right? And that workers legally have the right to do this. So companies like eBay that own TCG Player uh, ran a ruthless campaign in Syracuse, New York. I mean, daily meetings, like complete misinformation, um, interrogating people, surveilling them, right? I mean, one of the worst anti-union campaigns I've really ever seen. Um, we're seeing companies like Activision Blizzard who also have not, like, come to terms with the fact that they've got workers who have unions and they have to sit down at the table with them and really bargain in a, in a serious way that workers have a voice at the, at the bargaining table and have a voice in their working conditions. So I think the stumbling blocks are some of these companies that, that, that haven't accepted that yet, but the workers aren't letting up, right? I mean, and it's not up to the companies to make that decision. Like, we're gonna make them uh, move over and have a, have a seat. Workers are gonna have a seat at this table and, and that's what's gonna happen. And where does the situation of the workers like Rihanna stand at this moment? Has there been a contract? So, Rihanna, I think that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they've elected a bargaining committee and they're starting to circulate a bargaining survey. So all of the members of the union are starting to like look at what their priorities are and what kind of things they'd like to see changed in the workplace. And that elected bargaining committee is going to sit down at the table with Zinemax executives and bargain back and forth. Once they have a tentative agreement, everyone gets a vote on it and, um, and hopefully it passes. And if not, they go back to the table and bargain something different. Do you have a, a couple of favorite things on that list of demands or requests, Ryanna? Increased salaries is a big one. And the option for permanent work from home accommodations is another. These companies change ownership a lot, and I understand that in the Microsoft agreement, there's actually a fairly historic um, succession clause. Can you explain why that's so important? Yes, yes. So right now, there's a pending merger with Activision Blizzard and Microsoft, and Microsoft has signed an agreement basically saying if the merger goes through, this agreement, this neutrality and card check agreement where workers can freely form unions without intimidation, will apply to 10,000 of the workers at Activision Blizzard. And I think the workforce at Activision Blizzard is, is very excited about this and, and looking forward to, to organizing without you know, the, the brutal intimidation campaigns that we've seen. It's very exciting. Rihanna, how does that feel? You've changed not only your work life, it sounds like, but that of tens of thousands of other people too. It's, it's honestly empowering. We're so proud to be a part of this movement and we want the best for everyone. So what can people do if they're watching or listening to this and want to take action where they are inside this field? 
they can get in touch with a union organizer and, um, and start organizing in their workplace. They can go to uh, codecwa.org and fill out a form there and read about all of the other workers who have formed unions. We also have trainings twice a month where people can show up on Zoom and meet other game workers and tech workers from all across the country, sometimes from all across the world, and dig in and do a training together and learn how to organize their coworkers and, and start the process. Rihanna, anything you'd add to that? And I guess one last question, are we gonna see an organizing-based game anytime soon? <laughs> no word on any organized-based game that I am aware of. Um, I don't really have anything to add. Contact CWA, they've been great, and I'm pleased to work with them. Sounds like you know a Solidarity Forever game. We do, we do. We debuted it at uh, the Game Development Conference last year, and it is, uh, it's a video game that was developed by, um, by some of our members who work at Meow Wolf, and they basically, it's a, it's a worker who's trying to form a union, and he has to beat back the anti-union campaign. <laughs> Sounds like something even I could get into. Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Rihanna, fabulous to talk with you. That is it for City Works. Thank you, as I said, to Aaron Mahoney, Rihanna Eichner, and Nicole Carpenter, our guests today. If you have comments or questions, write to us at cityworks at slu.cuny.edu. For CityWorks, I'm Laura Flanders. Thanks for watching.